Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hey Coach Tony on ESPN Radio. I'm your host, Tony Fiorino. It's Saturday, August 27th. Hope everybody is getting ready to batten down the hatches for Hurricane Irene, who is already unleashing her fury on the world of sports. I believe uh, uh, the Jets-Giants game today was pushed up to uh, to a 2 o'clock start. I think of, uh, it was supposed to start at 7 or something like that. So needless to say, we're going to have to do uh, more than our share to keep ourselves safe and interested while the world of sports is being affected. But anyway... Each week here on Hey Coach Tony, we uh, we discuss the hottest topics in youth sports. And as always, we open up the phone lines to hear what's on your mind. So the studio lines are already open here at 855-HEY-COACH. That's 855-439-2622. Uh, we got a couple of things lined up for you today, but first and foremost, uh, I want to take a crack at tackling this whole University of Miami scandal. Uh, unless you've been living in a cave, you know that the Miami Hurricanes are under some significant scrutiny based on an, an expose that was written in uh, on, on, I should say, yahoosports.com. This uh, expose centers around now former Miami Hurricanes booster, a guy named Nevin Shapiro, who allegedly violated or took part in numerous NCAA violations that affected the Miami University football team. Now, this scandal has been the focal point of pretty much every sports broadcast over the past week or so, and I obviously didn't want to miss out on it, so <clears throat> I went searching for a source, and boy, did I, uh, did I find one. Uh, joining me on the show today is Brian London, and uh, Brian is currently a reporter covering the Miami Hurricanes for CBSSports.com where he's filed as many as 10 reports in a given day while he's been embedded with the team. He's also the co-founder and the co-editor-in-chief of a great site. It's called BeyondUSports.com. That's beyond the letter U, Sports.com. If you love college sports, you got to check out this site. Again, BeyondUSports.com. they got great writers. They cover all the, uh, the contemporary stories. Well, anyway, I was uh, I was able to track Brian down, and he was gracious enough to agree to join me today, so that we could discuss some of the subtleties in this evolving story. Later on in the show, who knows? We may take a crack at uh, some of the developments in the LSU story. If you haven't heard that, four of the uh, LSU football players uh, were implicated in a bar fight, which resulted in several injuries, and uh, two of the players right now are. I don't know if you want to call it in custody, but they have been arrested. They're being questioned by police. <clears throat> They've retained their attorneys, what have you. So these scandals in, uh, in college football are clearly not going away anytime soon. Uh, so, again, the studio lines are open at 855-HEY-COACH. That's 855-439-2622. But without any further ado, I'd like to uh, please introduce Brian London. Uh, hey, Brian, welcome to, uh, welcome to Hey Coach Tony. How are you doing this morning? All right, Adam is uh, Adam is apparently um, trying to get through to Brian here. We have a little bit of a trouble on the on the number, but uh, we'll get back to you uh, really quickly on the on the whole Brian thing. In the interim, let me give you a quick update on what's happening at uh, with the LSU situation. Uh, turns out that there are four players that were implicated in this uh, in this story. Uh, Jordan Jefferson, the starting quarterback. Josh Johns, a defensive lineman. Uh, Chris Davenport, an offensive lineman, and uh, Jarvis Landry, who is one of the receivers. Um, like I said, on Thursday, there was an issue here <clears throat> where four of these guys got involved in a brawl. Um, they were originally released on $5,000 bond on Friday in connection with this bar fight. Like I said, four people were injured. Um, Jefferson and Johns turned themselves in after police got their arrest warrants on felony charges of second-degree battery. Um, it sounds pretty bad. I mean, the, the, the police chief who, who took these guys in started talking about the evidence that's involved here, and the evidence includes, and I'll quote, numerous interviews of witnesses, including the victims uh, and the players that are implicated in the incident. And also, as always, guess what? Video evidence of certain individuals uh, who were present at the scene. So, so needless to say, um, 
anybody with a with a cell phone and, and a, an itchy trigger finger can implicate these college kids. And the question that I've got is, why do these guys keep doing this? <laughs> I, you know, I really got to wonder what what causes these guys to continue to to act the way that they act. Um, knowing that there's going to be repercussions. Now, obviously, you know, one of the uh, one of the most heralded games of the season was supposed to be LSU-Oregon. And right now I believe um, that Jordan Jefferson and Josh Johns uh, have been listed as ineligible, declared ineligible, um, and suspended indefinitely by the school. And, you know, needless to say, this is, this is going to be a... Uh, a, a more than challenging situation if if LSU is going to have any type any type at all of a uh, of a chance against Oregon and if they lose and like I said they're gonna uh, I think the only shot LSU is going to have at at any significant presence in the postseason or, or bowl presence they're going to have to pretty much run the table so I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on on specifically the LSU thing or if you have any questions about. Uh, what's going on with the University of Miami story? But uh, you can certainly give me a call here in the studio. It's uh, nine. I'm sorry, eight five five. Hey, coach. That's eight five five four three nine two six two two. One of the real serious issues around the Miami story, quite frankly, and a lot of people don't know this. They think that sportscasters are being a little bit facetious and, and dramatic. There is a chance that the University of Miami. Um, receives the death penalty. And just so you know, that doesn't mean that <laughs> they're not going to be lined up in front of a firing squad. Uh, there is something that the NCAA can invoke, and it is called the death penalty. And what that basically means is that there is a minimum of a one-year shutdown, kibosh, on the program. And it, it's not been a very popularized uh Penalty. It is not used very often. In fact, while you're thinking about whether or not University of Miami deserves the death penalty, uh, keep in mind that the death penalty has really only been used, I think it was only five times in history. Um, the reality of the situation is this goes back to some pretty early dates and some pretty obscure programs, but uh, the first such death penalty was issued to the University of Kentucky basketball program Back in 1952 for their 52-53 season, um, the basketball program at then University of Southwestern Louisiana, which is now University of Louisiana at Lafayette, they received the death penalty for their 73-74 as well as 74-75 seasons. Um, the one that everybody, well, I shouldn't say everybody, most people remember was when the SMU football program received the death penalty for 1987-88 seasons. Many will argue that SMU, you know, to this day is still suffering from uh, from that uh, from that harsh penalty. Now there were two more obscure ones: the Division II men's soccer program at Morehouse College received the death penalty uh, back in 2004-2005, and uh, the Division III men's tennis program at McMurray College, the perennial Division III tennis powerhouse, received the death penalty back in 2005. Uh, 2006, as well as their 06, 07 seasons. The, co the, the controversy around this death penalty is, you know, is it being too harsh on these schools to deliver such swift and brutal punishment, shutting down the programs? Um, you, you probably know where I come out on this one, but there are people who say, okay, is it harsh enough? You know, do we need to send a message to these schools? And I know that uh, as we're having some, uh, I think we're going to get through to Brian in just a minute here. Um, Brian is one who has written, and he wrote a great article, how giving the death penalty to the University of Miami would be a horrible mistake. And all it would do would, uh, in essence, be to cut the head off the monster uh, where three more are going to grow back in its place. So there's a lot of talk about, hey, everybody's doing it. Why are we coming down so hard on Miami? Why are we coming down so hard on LSU? Why are we coming down so hard on Ohio State? Well, the fact of the matter is, you know what? I don't know if I have the right answer for you guys, but uh, in reality, we're going to discuss this. Again, we're going to take your calls at... 91, uh, keep saying 914. That's giving away where I live. It's 855 Hey Coach. That's 855 439 2622. You know what? There was an email that came in while we're waiting to get Brian on the line here. There was an email that came in from Pete in Mayapak. And, and Pete writes in something that at surface level sounds pretty interesting and pretty straightforward and, and quite frankly, kind of logical. Um, Pete in Mayapak writes in Hey Coach Tony. An easy way to solve this and stop players 
from taking cash and gifts under the table is to just start paying the players, and this won't be a problem anymore. Well, hey, guys, I don't know if you remember, but I did a show on this. Um, I, guess, I guess it was a month or two ago. Uh, HBO Real Sports with Brian Gumbel did a whole show about whether or not amateur athletes should get paid. And uh, you know what? I was pretty lenient at the time because there are a lot of really just factual and pragmatic pieces to this. For example, <clears throat> college scholarship athletes, and these are the guys who tend to get in trouble, right? The superstars. They're not, they're not walk-ons. These are superstars, and they're the ones that are getting the, the $500 handshakes. Um, they're already getting paid. So, you know, Pete, if you're listening, I hope you call in with this one because I'd like someone to try to debate me on this. They are getting paid. Let's, you know, you're getting a full paid college education, which is not any insignificant amount of money. I mean, you're talking about some serious dollars in many of these cases. But today I want to throw that away for a second, and, and, and I want to ask you guys this. Let's assume you should pay college athletes, right? Let's assume we should pay them, right? There's billions of dollars flying around. Well, who gets paid, right? Who gets paid? How much do they get paid? Do you pay the starting quarterback the same as you pay your third-string quarterback? Do you pay the kicker? Do you pay the uh, the backup punter? How much do you pay these guys? Where does the money come from? See, a lot of folks don't realize that the money in college sports doesn't just go right back to the program. It's not just this, hey, we get to a bull bid, uh, here's our million dollars, and we're going to buy more helmets, and the rest just sits in a you know, freaking piggy bank. It doesn't work that way. The money-making sports, namely basketball and football, um, they help the whole college, and not just the athletics program, but even in the athletics program, this money goes to the fencing team, the water polo team, um, the field hockey team, all these, the bowling team, all these, these programs that really can't self-fund are all benefactors uh, and beneficiaries of the amounts of money that come in from TV revenues, etc. Now, throw into this equation also, guess what? You got Title IX. So now, you, you know, you got to pay, you want to pay the quarterback? You got to pay the, uh, the shortstop on the girls' softball team. You got to pay the gymnast, right? Who decides this pay scale? Now, even if these programs are pocketing all this money, here's the other thing that no one talks about, and I don't know why. So get, let me know what you think about this. Even if these programs were just pocketing all this money and they had it to spend carelessly on players like, like drunken sailors on leave, all that's going to do to college football is it's going to take the haves, which already seem to have you know a, a significant advantage from a perception perspective, but it's going to take the haves – and it's going to move them light years ahead of the have-nots. And educate. In other words, you know, you got these major programs: Miami, Ohio State, you know, Michigan, and all these these perennial powerhouses. And they already have the the allure of come play on TV. Uh, we're going to get to a bowl bid. Oh, by the way, if you play for us for two years, you're going to be a, you're going to be a, a draft prospect. Throw on top of that that hey, guess what we're going to do? On top of all that and the free education, you know, we're going to give you two hundred thousand bucks a year to come play for us. Is any decent player going to go to play somewhere else? This takes the whole idea of the apple cart in college football, and it just completely tips it on its back. So listen, if you have some thoughts about this, give me a call. I'm in the studio at 855-HEY-COACH. That's 855-439-2622. Um, Adam's telling me that we got Brian, but we're going to have to go to a break here in just a second. So when we come back... I'm going to have Brian London from CBSSports.com and the co-founder and co-editor-in-chief of BeyondUSports.com. You're listening to Hey Coach Tony on ESPN Radio. Stick around. Coach Tony. Hey, welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Hey Coach Tony on ESPN Radio. Um, this morning I am joined by Brian London of CBSSports.com as well as the uh, co-founder of BeyondUSports.com. And, again, if you're a college Sports fan, you got to get your butt up onto BeyondUSports.com. I was poking around it this week, and there's just some great stuff up there. Anyway, uh, Brian London is the co-founder. Brian is also uh, one of the more knowledgeable guys about this whole University of Miami scandal. This scandal involves a, a former, I guess, former booster named Nevin Shapiro. 
This guy was um, Daddy Warbucks, basically, to the University of Miami football program, and uh, he's created a lot of trouble. And uh, I'm I'm not going to get too much into the story because Brian's got a lot more detail on it, so I don't want to waste any more time. I want to welcome Brian to the show. Brian, welcome to Hey Coach Tony. How are you doing this morning? Hey, Coach, how are you? I'm doing great. Well, listen, I apologize for the phone problems this morning, but I'm very excited to have you on the show. Uh, Anybody who's not living in a cave has heard about this scandal, and i got to tell you, man, it's just it's, it's pretty darn close to the straw that's breaking the camel's back, and I don't know if guys like you who have literally been embedded with uh, programs like the U, if you guys are just like snake bike victims and it eventually just doesn't have any effect on you anymore, but, boy, this stuff drives me nuts, man. Every year there's a major scandal or two. Uh, let's, let's get down to some of the specifics. You know, With all that's transpired over the past couple of weeks, Tell me, what, what's the climate like around the University of Miami these days? Uh, <laughs> the climate, it's, uh, it's a frenzy. It's a frenzy down here. But, you know, it, just, to, just to kind of paint the picture, it, it kind of, you know, this year has been a tumultuous one for, for UM. You know, um, obviously Miami didn't have a great football season last year. Randy Shannon, the coach, was fired. Uh, after that, they hired Al Golden. Uh, Al Golden, uh, comes in from Temple and looks like he's gonna lead the charge and, and, um, is doing a great job. Then all of a sudden the athletic director, Kirby Hocutt, he leaves. Um, and then not too long after that, the head, uh, basketball coach, Frank Haith, leaves from Missouri. They hire Coach Laranega. Uh, so it's been one thing after another at UM over the past year. And actually, you know, covering this beat for the last 17 years, it, it's never a dull moment. That That's for sure. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I was in school at Miami the last time we went through this with the Pell Grant scandal. Um, so this is, it's like deja vu all over again. But yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, every day, um, you know, we're not, all, all of us that cover UM don't sleep much these days. We're kind of attached to our, uh, to our phones and to Twitter and to our emails, just waiting for the next thing to drop. Um, so it's, it's been exciting, but, you know, not in a great way. It, it takes a lot out of you uh, to cover one of these scandals. But, um, you know, it goes on, and I don't think it's going to, you know, I don't think the NCAA is going to rule anytime soon. So uh, this is something that's going to be a marathon, not a sprint, uh, for the next couple of months for uh, everyone uh, down here in Miami. Well, it'll be very interesting to see how this whole, and you can talk about it in a little bit, we'll get to that whole uh, suspension uh, reinstatement process, but I really want to start by talking about this booster, or I guess it's a former booster because he doesn't have any more money, <laughs> this guy Nevin Shapiro. Who, who exactly is this guy, and, and how, does, how does a guy like this get involved in a program like Miami? Yeah, here, here's the deal with Nevin Shapiro, and I actually uh, wrote, did write something about this on one of the other sites that I work for, which is allcanes.com. I do a show called All Canes Radio, and I talked about this uh, this past week. And, you know, Nevin was a guy that, um, a young guy, obviously had a lot of money. At one point in his life, he was a legitimate business guy, but obviously uh, got suckered uh, into, uh, or at least started suckering people into yeah. a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't feel um, he didn't he get became, suckered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, you know, he became a booster right when the Canes were, you know, at the pinnacle of college football back in 2001. And I think at that time he might have been legitimate. And just, uh, I think he came on board as just a regular booster. And, you know, look, here's the thing about the University of Miami. It's a small school, relatively speaking. There's only 9,000 undergrads on campus, you know, whereas you go to Ohio State or, or University of Florida, you're talking about 35, 45,000 kids on campus. So Miami is small in comparison. It's a small private school. There's not a lot of big money. There's not a lot of big donors and boosters to the athletic program. Really? I, mean, I, I, I traveled with. Uh, the team, you know, I was a sideline reporter and worked in the broadcast for a decade, and I can remember maybe once this guy actually traveling with the team or, or, or being on a team plane or going on a road trip. So this guy was not your regular booster. Um, you know, I know all the boosters. I know the donors. There's not too many of them. I, I know a lot of them. A lot of them are friends. This kind of this guy was kind of hanging out in the background, and uh, you know, I think. In retrospect, that kind of made them even more shady because most of the boosters, most of the donors are kind of out in the public and they're around and, you know, they're, it's all legitimate. You know, they, their, their uh, interest in, in helping the school out is simply just, hey, that's my alma mater or that's a school that I love. I just want to donate some money to, to help the athletic program. But now come to find out, Nevin Shapiro, he had ulterior motives, and those motives 
really started to kind of come into fruition around 2003, 2004, when he realized that, you know, uh, because he was a donor, because he was a booster, he, he got himself access. And that's not, you know, abnormal. I mean, every school, I mean, depending on your donor level, I mean, you're able to have an athlete that you're able to communicate with or you're able to go to team functions and all that stuff. So that's not abnormal. But he realized that because of that, he could try to befriend players. And let's be honest, here's a guy, and look, I, I'm short myself, so I realize it, but he's a guy that's 5'5", five five, and obviously you might have had a bit of a complex and realized that here's this guy that, you know, this kind of scrawny, uh, small five five guy that now he can befriend, you know, big athletes, guys that are recognized around town, guys that, you know, when he shows up with an athlete at a restaurant, wow, he gets the best table. He gets you know, he gets inside. So I think he kind of went off the deep end and decided that instead of following the normal booster donor program, he was going to do what he could to befriend athletes. And uh, obviously from there it, it went downhill. But, um, you know, with all that being said, you know, it, 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 it's kind of a shame that the story is not getting out that, you know, here's one guy that kind of went rogue, went off the deep end, whereas there's 99.9% of donors or boosters, not just in Miami, but everywhere around the country that do it the legitimate way and there's no problems with. But, uh, you know, one guy ruins it for everybody, I guess. Well, uh, well I, 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 I'll agree with you on that. At the same time, I think this comes down to some of this comes down to where the onus, you know, should lie. I mean, you, you said he's not the average. It was, I don't know if this was in hindsight, but you say, okay, he's not the typical donor. He's not the typical booster. Well, and especially at a smaller school, wouldn't you think that perhaps the administration um, of the school and the athletic department? Wouldn't it be a lot easier to check under the guy's fingernails, do some background checks on someone who's yeah, just so you know, close? Actually, they did hire a private investigator to follow him, and they didn't come up with anything. But let's remember, this is a guy that suckered uh, a bunch of people out of close to a billion dollars. And we're not talking we're not talking just, you know, the poor grandma who sees an infomercial on TV and sends her 995 for whatever product. <laughs> no, we're talking legitimate Big-time people with big-time money thought that his investment scheme was completely fine and completely normal, and he conned them out of their money. So from that, you realize this guy obviously knew uh, how to be a good actor, how to be a good con man, how to cover his tracks, how to cover his trail. And they did hire an, a private investigator later, later in his tenure as a booster, but didn't come back with anything. Um, the other thing is, you know, I wrote about this, which is if this, if any of this goes on at a small college town like a Tuscaloosa mm -hmm. or a Lincoln, Nebraska, or a Columbus, uh, this gets all pointed out much earlier because, you know, some of the stuff that he did, you know, if you try to go uh, basically purchase every room on the floor of a hotel in yep. Tuscaloosa, well, uh, everyone's going to be talking about that. That doesn't happen every day. But here in, in, in South Florida, in, in Miami, in South Beach, I mean, that's a normal occurrence. I mean, things that don't happen anywhere else happen here, and no one bats an eye. So uh, man, I, I was going to ask you that, that. I mean, Miami's had so, I mean, more than its share of shadows cast on it, and, and I don't know if anyone's really identified why. It sounds like you're onto something here with this idea. Is going to school in Miami that much different than the typical college town? Yeah, not, it's not even close. I mean, not it's, it's, it's not even close. I mean, I think the only school that could be similar is USC out in LA. I mean, that's it. I mean, I, I've traveled the country. I've been to every big time school, every big time stadium. It, it's nothing like going to school down here. Um, it's just a completely vibe. You know, the on campus life, it, it's, it's not that it's non existent, but it's not really there. It's when you go to school at Miami, even though that the University of Miami is in a suburb called Coral Gables, which mm -hmm. is, you know, an affluent suburb. It's not really in downtown. You're only, tw you know, 10, 15 minutes away from downtown. You're only 20 minutes away from South Beach. You have Coconut Grove. You have, uh, Fort Lauderdale. You, I mean, you have just so many spots where you can just get lost and be off the grid and get into things that, you know, you can't even dream of. Um, that doesn't happen other places. I mean, you look at, like, the Ohio State thing, well, there was a tattoo deal. Well, you know, everyone everyone started to find out that these players were going to that tattoo shop. Why? Small college town, word travels quickly. Not in Miami. I mean, you can literally just disappear, be off the grid. No one will ever, you know, figure out what you're up to. And that's kind of, you know, think about it. Uh, I mean, we had, we've had we had three Ponzi schemers down here. There was a guy, Scott Ross, Scott Rothstein, that, that swindled a bunch of money, everyone. I mean, it seems like that 
everyone that wants to get into something illegitimate comes down here. Why? Because you can just disappear down here. And that that is part of it. Um, back to your original question, though, there is definitely some responsibility on the part of the University of Miami, the administration, um, to figure out what this guy was up to. And I know they tried, but obviously came up too short. And, yeah, the responsibility does fall back on the U. Well, we're going we're gonna to get to some more of that in, in just a minute. And, again, the studio lines are open at 855-HEY-COACH. That's 855 855- Four three nine two six two two. I did get a couple of emails in Brian that we're going to uh, that we're going to get to uh, when we get back from break, and we're going to be talking about all this stuff. So I want to get your your opinions on this. Before we do go to break, though, I want to remind you folks that there's uh, there are ways to stay connected to the show when we're not on the air. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Hey Coach Tony. You can join my page on Facebook. Just search for Hey Coach Tony on ESPN Radio. You can even dial the hotline uh, when the show's not on the air at eight five five Hey Coach. You can comment on the show. You can suggest topics that you want me to cover. You can even tell me how much uh, you hate the show. Right? Anything you want to send to me, make sure you keep touch on Twitter, Facebook, and on the hotline. Uh, like I said, when we get back, we're going to dig in more on this uh, University of Miami scandal. And uh, like I said, you guys sent in a couple of good emails, and so there are some things that Brian and I are going to talk about. We'll take your calls. Stick around. You're with Hey Coach Tony on ESPN Radio. Coach Tony. Hey, welcome back, everybody. You're with Hey Coach Tony uh, on ESPN Radio, joined today by Brian London, who has just got a terrific background. This guy has been uh, just a fly on the wall at the University of Miami for, for quite a long time, and he's got some great information here. We, uh, By the way, during the break, I got an email. Someone asked... Um, you know, did this guy happen to go to the University of Miami? And he and he did. Brian did. And he didn't try to hide that. So, and he doesn't lose any objectivity at all. Uh, Brian was very forthcoming that said, "Hey, by the way, I do I did go to the U." But uh, there was an email I got during the week, Brian, that I wanted to hit you with. This came from Billy in Richfield, and he writes in and says, "Hey, Coach Tony, I'm curious why the NCAA doesn't dig in as hard with other schools as they do with schools like Miami and Ohio State uh, and, and the brand names." Um, we all know there are plenty of schools that are guilty of NCAA violations. Uh, Brian, you want to tackle that one before I hit it? What was the what was the outside of the question again, Tony? Basically, somebody's complaining. They want to, they want to know why the NCAA isn't digging into all the other programs. I, I, I'm getting a boo hoo. They're picking on Miami thing. It becomes it, it, it comes down to this. It's it's um, they go with the low hanging fruit. Um, which is uh, because they're just understaffed. I mean, I think the NCAA has like 138 staffing members when it comes to investing in all this stuff. There's there's too many schools out there for them to get. And, and, and I think there's a realization pretty much everywhere in college football that, I mean, you could show up at the doorstep unannounced of any school and start digging and find something. It's mm-hmm. just but the way the rules are, and, and, and this, I mean, I'm not, this is not to excuse anyone's behavior, but the way the rules are, I mean, it's, it's nearly impossible to stay completely clean. I mean, you can have the best compliance department. You can have the best uh, athletic administration. Um, and it's, it's just the way the rules are. It's just almost uh, impossible to stay clean. Uh, but, again, from the NCAA standpoint, it's a funding st- uh, staffing issue. I, don't, I just don't think they can cover all of that territory the way they'd like to. Well, I, and I want to hit that one in just a second, but I, I want to get to a couple of calls. I don't want to hog it to myself all day. I think we have, uh, you know, what? I think we're going to go to line two where we've got John uh, calling in. Hey, John, you're on. Hey, Coach Tony. John. All right. Well, I think we lost. I think we lost John. Um, hopefully, we didn't lose Brian. Brian, you still with us? I'm, I'm right all here. All right, great. So we're going to see. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I do get to hog you here. You know, one of the things that 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 stands out, as far as I'm concerned, as I, and I try to consider myself a layperson as, 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 as often as I can. Somebody asks, you know, why are they digging into Miami? Why are they digging into OSU? Two things. One, you call it low-hanging fruit. I call it going where the smoke is, right, to go see if you can find a fire. But the other side of this, you know what, you know what I noticed, Brian? Not one guy emailed me, and I'm sure nobody's emailed you, complaining about all the TV time that these guys get. I mean, you, you can't have an elite program and... Try to play one side of the equation. You know, yeah, it, with all the upside comes all the potential scrutiny. I mean, don't you agree? Is and and is that unfair? No, not at all. I think I think I think I, you know. There's so much. To, here's the, here's the deal. It all stems from money. I mean, all of this just stems from money. There's so much money being made on college athletics. I mean, and that's where the problem comes from because 
you know, there's uh, all this money is being made by everybody except for the players. And I know that you'll, you know, everyone's going to say, well, they get an education. Well, that that is true. They they do get an education, and and I valued my college education. I'm sure everyone else out there does as well. But the money that's made on them is way more than the you know thirty thousand dollar education or whatever the amount is that they get per year. I mean, the money coming in is ridiculous. Uh, and that's and that's what drives all this stuff. I mean, it's just money, the TV coverage, the hype, the promotion. Um, that's where the problem lies because there's so much money being made by everybody that you know. And you look, I mean, look at the Ponzi scheme. I mean, that involved money. Anytime you involve a ton of money in something, it's going to go south somewhere. Yeah, well, and you know what? And but while we were having our phone troubles, I had another email about someone who said, "Hey, just you know, basically, you want to solve this? Just pay the players." Uh, you know, Brian, I, don't I gotta think tell it you, solves it. It doesn't solve it because we went through a couple of things. Who do you pay? How much do you pay them? And I think people are misled. There's a, don't get me wrong, ton of money flying around college athletics. But it's not just like, you know, the football coach from Miami gets, uh, here's your million dollar check from, uh, from your bowl bid. You know, go do whatever you want with it. That, that doesn't happen. I mean, the, the, the elite sports do fuel the entire university and it does aid in the stature of the university. But again, even if, tell me what you think about this because no one talks about this one. Even if you did have a blank check and you started paying players, all that does, in my opinion, is it takes the, you know, it, it feeds the eagles and starves the turkeys. It takes the haves and gives them more ammunition to put themselves light years ahead of the have-nots. If I'm if I'm a major program and on top of what could be anywhere between you know 120 to a 250 thousand dollar chunk of change for for an education, now I'm also going to say you know what I'll pay 100 200 grand a year to play here. You know, how the hell does any other coach that doesn't generate the TV revenues, how do you go recruit? Because then you get better and you get more TV time and more bowl bids and more endorsements, and it just becomes this ridiculously lopsided failure. Do you disagree no, with I that? I think you just basically spelled out uh, what people have been talking about. And, you know, if there's anything that, 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 that is good that can come from this Miami situation, regardless of what the penalty is, um, it's that maybe it causes the system to change. I mean, it, it is about the haves and the have-nots, and I think there really is starting to be a push from the underground of the schools that have separating from the schools that have not mm -hmm. and playing, you know, uh, operating outside of the NCAA, starting their own league, starting their own thing, and, uh, and just including themselves so that they don't have to worry about the have-nots. Um, because as long as there's... Uh, a need to worry about all 119 Division 1A schools, um, then all of a sudden it, it becomes an uneven playing field, and the schools in the bottom just will never make it to the top because they can't because of funds. But you know, you really, you really brought out what the whole situation is and why people really think that this Miami situation will, at one point or another, help to cause the end of the NCAA. Uh, and you know what? Maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing, and that's for that's for another show. I want to try to again. I want to take another crack at, at trying to get some of these calls. So I hope when we're at, done with our technical problems, I want to see if we can go back to line two and see if John can join us on the conference here. Hey, John, are you with okay. us? Okay. John's with us. John was with us. <laughs> I heard a voice there. All right, Brian. You know what? I'll stick with you, buddy. Um, the other thing that that came up is. You know, and you mentioned it before, and I think it's worth mentioning again. There was a lot of stuff happening at the U. You know, ADs leaving, coaches leaving, what have you. Some may say uh, signs of things to come. So these allegations are now they're all over the news, right? But I think people lose sight of the fact that you know, just a couple of months ago, uh, while these things were going on, it wasn't a major story. So the question I got is, did the new coaches coming in to the football program know about this investigation when they took their jobs? Uh, we lost Brian too. <laughs> All right. Um, you know what we're gonna do while we're while we're sorting out the uh, the, the phone issues. I think we're gonna go to uh, to a quick break here. But when we get back, we will have Brian London back on the line. Don't know if we're gonna be able to take your calls, but uh, you can certainly hit me up on the email at heycoachtony at gmail dot com. And uh, obviously, we're going to continue talking on this story because there's a lot more to this. And uh, Brian is obviously very knowledgeable. You're listening to Hey Coach Tony on ESPN Radio. Stick around here, Coach Tony. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, you're with Hey Coach Tony on ESPN Radio, joined this morning by Brian London, who has just been uh, terrific with regard to his knowledge and insights on this University of Miami scandal. 
Uh, Brian is a reporter with CBSSports.com. He's also with uh, with All Canes Radio. Is the co-founder of uh, BeyondUSports.com, which you definitely got to check out. I got to tell you, it's amazing. Hey, Brian, one thing, um, and, and by the way, I apologize for these uh, phone problems. Maybe the hurricane's hitting us a little earlier than I thought. But uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you is there is some pretty drastic talk going on right now about what should be done to the university in general, the football program, what have you. And there is talk of this dreaded death penalty. And a lot of people joke, and they think that the death penalty means should we just go kill everybody at the University of Miami? Um, Obviously, that's not the case. Can you please explain to the listeners what the death penalty is? And then let's talk about whether or not that's really appropriate given uh, the circumstances here. Yeah, the death penalty basically... Uh, as I understand it, is they, they shut down your program, not permanently, but maybe for a year or two, um, really, and so you can't feel the team for a year or two, which obviously hurts you in so many other places because, like most schools, football provides the funding for a lot of the other sports. Mm-hmm. So all the non-revenue sports, like your track and field and your and your crew and your uh, your women's soccer, women's volleyball, all of the all of those sports, a lot of them get all of their funding from the revenue generated by football. So uh, it's called the death penalty because what you're doing is by not allowing a team's uh, a school's football team to even feel the team for a year or two, you're basically choking off the revenue for the entire athletic department, uh, hereby uh, killing it for uh, a while. So um, that's why it's called the death penalty. And, you know, it's only been used once uh, really in major big-time football, and that was SMU about 25 years ago. And, uh, you know, Coach Tony, uh, I think the NCAA learned – this is why I, I – this is how you found me, which is great because, you know, I appreciate you checking out beyondusports.com. But, you know, I think the NCAA learned – their lesson from the SMU situation. And let's first of all point out that SMU, I mean, they had a slush fund set up for players for like 15 years. They, I mean, Eric Dickerson got a car to go to school there. I mean, it was just so crazy. It was the wild, wild west. And it was not just one, one booster. I mean, you had state uh, government officials involved in it. You had university officials involved in it. You had multiple boosters, not just one guy, and that's why the NCAA took the route they did with the death penalty for SMU. But I think the NCAA learned their lesson in that case and realized that the death penalty doesn't just harm a school for a few years or five years. I mean, SMU is still trying to make its way back to what it was, and we're talking 25 years later. I just don't. I know that Mark Emmert, the president of the NCAA, has said, "Hey, yeah, we would use this," but I think it would have to be such a dire. I mean, it would have to be. So crazy, and I know the Miami allegations sound crazy, but we well, can get to this. In reality, it's really not. The, the situation would have to be so dire that there's just no other choice for the NCAA. I don't think it's going to happen in this case because, there's too, again, it goes back to the money. It all stems from the money. The, the ACC would actually have a, a meltdown if Miami couldn't play football because of all the revenue generated throughout the conference because of revenue sharing and TV money and the deal with ESPN. All the folks at ESPN who, on one hand, on Sports Center, I mean, love to throw the U up and, and talk about the death penalty on their new side, but in programming, the, I, I can only imagine that they're, they're you know, bending over the trash barrel because if, if Miami doesn't play football, uh, there go ratings and some of the highest rated games that's played. That's why the death penalty is not going to happen. I mean, you could argue, and I would obviously argue against Miami deserving the death penalty, but that's different from the reality of the situation, which is I just don't think it's going to happen because the climate of the NCAA right now is so much different than it was 25 years ago. The money is exponentially higher, and it would just hurt too many programs, too many people to uh, to end Miami program or any other program for that matter for a year or two. Yeah, but you, you know what? Let, let me play, and I'm not, I'm not sure if it's devil's advocate, but let's, let's explain, I mean, SMU. Let me ask you, really? Anybody really miss SMU? The, the NCAA no, and, no, and college no. football I mean, survives. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm sure in, in Texas they probably miss SMU. <laughs> and, and, and look, here's the thing about SMU, and, and you know, I'm not sure if you saw it, but the pony, the, uh, 
the uh, the thirty for thirty uh, documentary they had mm-hmm. on ESPN was just wonderful. Yep. Um, as was the one uh, by my good friend Billy Corbin about the U on ESPN. Yep. Um, and you know SMU really only contended for a title for a couple of years. Uh, you know, not the same as a Miami or an Alabama or an LSU that you know year in and year out could have been in the title hunt. Uh, Miami's won five national championships. It's a little bit different than a school just contending for a title, but still, you know, to the people in Texas, I mean SMU is very important. Um, and you're talking about a state that loves their football more than anything else. So, yeah, you, from a national perspective, maybe up there in the Northeast you may not miss SMU, but I think uh, throughout the, the West and the Midwest and in and, and college parts of America, uh, they might miss the Mustangs and, and what they were able to do. Well, you know what, and, and, and I think it's – well, and here's another point to maybe make on this. You know, we're talking – the Miami is the Hurricanes. New York is bearing down for, for our own hurricane hitting here. You know, every 10, 15 years – is it maybe opportunistic? And, and this is the timing. You know, you said Miami didn't have the greatest year. Is now, is it, it maybe an opportune time for the NCAA to send a message and drop the hammer on the death penalty on, you know, a, on, on an organization that didn't do great by its own standards? Maybe it's time to send a message and say, guys, guess what? It happened to SMU and they disappeared. It happened to, yeah. to the U and it disappeared. Don't be the next ones. Yeah, I mean, you can look at it that way. I just, in the end, I just, there's, there's just too much, too many, there's too many corporate interests involved for them to do that. There just is, because on one hand, they would say, yes, let's show a message, but then you have, ESPN, the ACC, all of their corporate sponsors. I mean, Miami's played in, uh, you know, a handful of the top-rated college football games. I mean, every time they play Miami and Florida State, it's on ESPN. I mean, it's one of the highest-rated uh, football games that ESPN shows. Mm-hmm. I just think there's too many corporate interests involved that are going to start, you know, basically lobbying the NCAA to say, hey, punish them, sure, but give us give us something to show on TV because we'd lose too much money without that. Um, I just think that's what it's going to come down to. It's sad. You know, it's sad that it always comes back to money, and this is supposed to be about amateurism, and it's supposed to be about, you know, education and, and all that stuff, and that's what I believe in. But um, the corporate interests are just too much and too heavily involved, I think, for that to happen. Well, let, let's talk about them, what, because everyone agrees. I don't think anybody, um, with the exception of someone truly ignorant, thinks that nothing should happen here. I mean, we're talking about right. hookers, right. drugs, boat rides, parties. I mean, this is stuff that clearly doesn't belong Actually, anywhere. Actually, there, there were no sports. drugs, so that let's... Oh, but not, not, not in this scandal. There. You're okay. Yes, not in this particular one. Okay, <laughs> but I mean, listen. The NCA has a punishment that they could hand down, which is a television ban. But based on what you just said, how how feasible is a television ban? Yeah, it's not going to happen. I, let, you know, here's what I think is going to happen, and I, and I don't know. And first, let's separate the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, you know, the Yahoo story was great, and Charles Robinson's one of the best investigative journalists there is on the planet, and he spent 11 months of his life digging into the story. But the Yahoo investigation does not equal the NCAA investigation. And even more to that point is the NCAA actually, by their own bylaws, cannot use anything that Yahoo found. In other words, if Charles Robinson found a receipt uh, you know, that he has laying around in his living room. The NCAA can't go to his house and get that to use as evidence. They have to do their own independent investigation. So the Yahoo story is great. I thought it was well written. I thought it was journalistically sound. There might have been some holes that I could poke in it for, on some details, but overall, great story. But, you know, the, the onus, all of the, uh, the focus of the Yahoo story was all about the 73 players and all this stuff with, on the boats and the mansions and all that stuff. And it's really salacious. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, sensational, and it's a great read. And if you're a guy reading that, and you're reading about a player with a hooker on a boat, I mean, that's that's I mean, that's just wonderful reading. <laughs> but when it all comes down to it, that's not what this investigation is about. And what I've learned in the last week of the story and talking to my sources, I mean, yes, that's going to bring some some problems to the university, most likely with the current players, because they really can't. You can't, you know, Andre Johnson. I'm just going to use him as an example, but Andre Johnson now plays for the Texans, played at UM. You know, how are you going to prove that Andre Johnson was on a guy's yacht at a such and such a date with, you know, a lady of the night? It's just not going to happen. You can't, there's no receipt for that. So, and pictures aren't, you know, pictures aren't going to do that. You know, just because you have a picture with somebody, well, I can walk out into South Beach right now and five 3,000 stars to take a picture with. That doesn't mean that I know them. Um, but what this is going to come down to is the administrative part of this, which is, 
uh, you know, former athletic director Kirby Hocutt, former athletic director Paul D., uh, Donna Shalala, the president. Uh, we're talking about coaches, assistant coaches, Clint Hurd at Louisville. Uh, we're talking about uh, Jeff Stoutland and Joe Padunzio at Alabama and, uh, and, and all the other assistant coaches, Frank Hayes at Missouri, his assistants. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the adults. That's where this investigation is going. That's what's going to cause Miami harm, if, mm-hmm. depending on what they find. It's not going to be all the salacious details of players on a boat partying. I mean, hell, you, if, if I go down to Biscayne Bay right now and go check, take a look at every yacht out there, there's not one of them that's not going to have some 20-year-old kid partying with his shirt off holding a, an alcoholic beverage. I mean, mm-hmm. that's par for the course. Oh, um, it's all the other stuff, the, the adults that were supposed to be responsible for looking out for these kids and making sure they did not get involved with the wrong people. That's where the trouble comes. And as far as the penalty goes, I mean, I'm going to guess um, USC Plus is probably what I'm looking at, which is, you know, if they got 30 scholarships in a few years, bull ban and, and probation, I think that's probably what Miami is looking at with a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's going to be a TV ban, and I don't think there's going to be a death penalty. Well, there won't be a TV ban, but you know what? You take... 35, 40 scholarships away from that school. It's going to impact, you would think, it's going to impact the program. And if their popularity falls, won't that have an impact on TV as well? Yeah, from a standpoint, remember, Miami's been through this before. They lost 30 scholarships back in uh, the mid-'90s for a Pell Grant scandal. Yeah. And that was a lot worse than this. That was a uh, school staffer messing around with federal money. Yeah, defrauding uh, I mean, taxpayers, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um and, and what happened is Miami, you know, was down and out. They only had really one horrible year. 1997, they went 5-6. and six, And then they slowly made their climb back and obviously won the national championship four years later. Mm-hmm. So they did get affected for about five or six years, but then eventually made their way back. Um, and as far as the TV thing, well, you know, I think we've all come. To, it's just like people love the Hurricanes and people hate the Hurricanes, just sure. like they do with the Yankees or any other team. So, you know, I'm a Red Sox fan, <laughs> and I don't know if that plays well with the I didn't realize. But, I would have never had you on the show had I known that. <laughs> I know, but, but you know, for me personally, if, if I see the Yankees are losing, I'm going to tune in to, to point my finger and laugh. Sure. Um, and, and a lot of New Yorkers will do the same with the Red Sox. If the Red Sox are losing to the Orioles, you might tune in just to watch, you know, watch, watch a, a bad look on uh, Terry Francona's face. Sure. Same thing with the Hurricanes. Yeah. Is even if they're not good, they're such a polarizing program that people will tune in to watch them lose. And yeah. I think that, and that's, and that's the hypocritical thing about this is because the, is basically ESPN and everybody else will make money on the program faltering. And um, you know there will be it, it is going to hurt the program, but I think in the end, as we've seen with almost every other program aside from SMU, is you get through it and you come back eventually. So you know, real question here, you know, just being the, putting my regular guy hat on for a quick second. Should anybody, and I know you went to school there, and I know you followed these guys, should anybody really be surprised that this happened at Miami, given its history? Mm, no. Okay. No, and I mean, from no, just from my regular guy hat, no, not at all. I mean, just considering the climate of where the school is, and um, you, 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 it could happen. I don't think anyone should be surprised if it happens anywhere. I, know. Uh, I mean, really, to be honest <laughs> with you, it just that's the nature of college athletics, and I, I don't like it. I mean, as an alum of the U, you know, I was really proud when Randy Shannon had the University of Miami like number three in the nation in academics uh, for football. I mean, graduating all their players. One guy had gotten arrested in four years. Can't say the same about schools like Florida or an LSU Absolutely. that find yeah. themselves in a crime blotter. I was really proud of that. Should be. Because um, that's, that's important to me as an alum. But in all reality, I mean, that's not, that's not where the focus is in real college athletics. And so, no, it shouldn't be surprising. But it shouldn't be surprising anywhere. That's the nature of the game now. Now, let me ask you this. Um, do you think, and oh, I'll just say it, I think that Shapiro's testimony that anything he can't prove is going to be seriously called into question because not a lot of people know this. When he was incarcerated, he reached out to several players, and I don't know if it was administrators as well, but apparently he reached out to several players for financial help, for bail, for other various reasons, and the guy was basically treated like a leper. He was basically well, kicked to the curb. Does that have any impact on the, the validity of this guy's testimony or even the facts that he's no, trying to portray? No, I mean, the NCAA has used felons before for, for – uh, you know, to get evidence from and whatnot. Yeah, it doesn't look good. And that's where it stems from. Really, the story comes from the fact that he's this guy that had helped out all these players and, and, and let them, you know, use his life for, for their play. Um, 
open in the end when when he needed financial assistance um, or when he needed help, uh, they turned their back on him. And, and it's smart that they did because I can only imagine if what had happened if they hadn't. Um, and he he felt like they turned a cold shoulder, and now he was going to get back at them. And the thing that makes this case different from every other case that's out there or any other allegation that's out there is if something happens in Auburn or Alabama, if there's a rogue booster there, well, nine times out of ten, they're not going to ever say anything because they don't want to ruin their reputation. I mean, you may have Chuck's car dealership in Alabama that might be funneling money to to some player. Well, he's not going to want to ruin his reputation and risk not selling cars. Well, in this case, Neville Shapiro has nothing to lose. So there's no reason. His reputation's already ruined. He conned people out of almost a billion dollars. So there's no reason for him not to disclose everything and go at Miami. And that's what makes the situation a little bit different. Uh, he acted like some. Uh, I almost said something inappropriate for the radio, but he acted like a like a like a like a girl who, um, whose boyfriend tried to go a little too far during the movie. And and, and that sounds stupid now because I can't say it the way I want to say it. But I mean, he's a little wuss. I mean, the guy got tagged. For something he did, which is – forget about all – listen, let's put it in perspective here, Brian. Forget about the the hookers and forget about the payoffs to the college players. This guy scammed a billion dollars out of people's pockets. You know, not a hot enough place in hell for this guy. And now you go crying, boo-hoo, somebody bail me out? These kids – listen, by the way, I hope the boosters are following this story closely. If you're, if you're giving those $500 handshakes, these kids don't care. Once you get that money out of their pocket, they don't care. They just don't. Brian, man, listen. This is a quick hour of my life gone by one more time. You have been an amazing guest, and you have free reign to come back anytime, my man. I really do appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, you just get my number correct. Call me anytime. <laughs> hey, folks, listen. Every Saturday, 9 a.m., please be sure to tune in to Hey Coach Tony on ESPN Radio. Be safe during the hurricane. I'll see you next week.